Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Captain Thad Darger, former F-117 stealth fighter pilot with the United States Air Force, is here, and we're going to hear all about his life story, about the aircraft. It's, it's just fascinating, uh, and I cannot wait to introduce all of you uh, to him. He's a really remarkable individual. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, we are right in the middle of another Social Flights Fly to Win Challenge. We are this time giving away an Aspen E5 electronic flight instrument. That is glass for your cockpit, and you could win that just by get it going to socialflight.com, get the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices, and just check in. Even if you only check in at one airport, you're entered to win that Aspen E5. And then, in addition to that, if you go and you check in during your travels at multiple airports and you compete and you find your way onto the leaderboard, you may get extra entries into that drawing. We just gave away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset and uh, uh, we just keep giving away more and more with Social Flight. So be sure to check all of that out. In addition, Social Flight's FAA learning system is available on all of those platforms. All you have to do is go on there and click on the FAA safety icon for the safety team and you can get wings uh, credits for watching different programs and taking quizzes there. If you're an AMP or a maintenance technician, you can uh, qualify in there and get recurrent training credits and certificates for your renewal. There's just tons of things in there. So be sure to check out socialflight.com with all of the aviation events, destinations, and more inside of it. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Avidyne and the IFD 550, 540, 440 series and all of the other products that they have uh, in the works and coming. And I want to talk about this for a minute just because I'm a huge fan of the IFD integrated navigators. Uh, and we just did a very complicated IFR flight uh, this weekend, uh, heading down uh, to New Jersey to Caldwell and back. And uh, I'm always amazed at how simple they have made the navigation using these devices. Uh, I uh, We got a very complex, uh, well, I, for to some it might not be complex. For me, we got a complex clearance going down there flying IFR in very challenging conditions. And man, it was quick. I mean, they literally just gave us clear to Caldwell Airport via you know, Bosox, Victor 1, Hartford, Victor 229, Seal, Victor 188, Carmel, Victor 623, Sparta, all these things. And yet putting it in to the IFD was a snap because it just predicts what's coming next. So be sure to check that out. If you're going to um, Oshkosh and Air Venture, check that out. We'll be there as well. And now to tonight's guest. Captain Thad Darger is a fourth generation military veteran and third generation military pilot with nearly 3,000 flight hours in the T-38 Talon, the B-1 Bomber, and the F-117 Nighthawk Stealth Fighter. Thad flew multiple combat missions over Yugoslavia in the stealth fighter in 1999 during Operation Allied Force, attacking multiple strategic targets during that conflict. Following his Air Force career, Thad was a United Airlines pilot for the past 20 years, has been involved in sales leadership and consulting. Thad's various Air Force decorations include the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Aerial Achievement Medal, and the Air Force Commendation Medal. Thad joins us tonight from central Massachusetts, right nearby Social Flight's home base. So you just may see him again soon, assisting with our Titan T-51D Mustang build behind me. Hopefully we'll, we'll get him out here as well. But I'm going to bring him on the line now. So please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Captain Thad Darger. How are you doing tonight? I am wonderful. Thank you very much for the introduction. That was very kind of you. Oh, uh, let me tell you, I am absolutely thrilled to have you here on the show. Your your background is truly inspiring, and having it, the opportunity to fly that aircraft, it, it just blows my mind. So take me back. Let, help me understand. You've got this remarkable family history. Tell me a little bit about that and what led you to the cockpit within the military. Yeah, and you, you've already kind of mentioned it. Um, I'm fourth generation military on my father's side, and so I have a grandfather that was in World War II. He was a Navy CV that kind of hopped across the Pacific. And then my father, who's um, going to turn 81 years old here in about uh, two weeks, um, was a Marine Corps helicopter pilot in Vietnam um, and had that, that service. I, of course, as you just mentioned, um, spent about 11 years on active duty in the Air Force. 
And then my oldest daughter, who's 29 years old, is currently an instructor pilot in the C-17, the Globemaster, um, based out of Charleston, South Carolina. So yeah, three generations, I'm right in the middle. So going, going, going five generations, <laughs> holy mackerel, yeah. five generations of service, and, and uh, that, that's, that's really impressive. Um, Thank you. What made you decide now uh, to tell me your path into the military a little bit? Yeah, so it was kind of, it's probably like most people, it, it wasn't intentional. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I tell people all the time, I used to sit in my dad's office. My dad was in sales, just like I am. And I used to sit in my dad's office and, and look at his shadow box on the wall from his time in the Marine Corps and what he did uh, as a CH-46 pilot um, and some of the great things that he did in the Marine Corps. And as I grew up and, and as you used to sit in a classroom in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and watch Air National Guard uh, fighters land at Joe Foss Field uh, in Sioux Falls, where I grew up, it just kind of became something that I was interested in. And my dad gave me the right little nudges uh, along and, and I ended up attending the Air Force Academy, so. Wow, now you had mentioned to me at one point that he kind of, you, you valued that, that he, he didn't push you in any way towards that. that. Tell me a little bit about the Air Force Academy and, and yeah, what, what, I think what that process was. Yeah, I think when we talked earlier, I mentioned the fact that that's a really, really personal decision. Um, the, the military academies have become very good lately at putting in your acceptance letter that if you're attending a military academy for any reason other than the fact that you want to be there and you want to have that kind of commitment that you really shouldn't attend. And my dad knew that 40 years ago. He knew that it had to be something that I wanted to do. It had to be something that was coming from inside of me. And so as much as my dad would talk to me about what a great opportunity it was, he never gave me the push where he said, hey, I really think that you should go do this, or I think it's really important uh, that you go do this. And, and fortunately, I kind of carried that down to my daughter and did the exact same thing with her. She visited the academy with me, and we talked about how beautiful it was and what an opportunity it was and, and what the mil military can provide um, from an experience standpoint and everything else. Um, but not once did I ever tell her that I thought she should go to the Air Force Academy. So. Uh, I guess that's another generational thing that's happened in our family. Yeah. What does it feel like to, I, I guess, have the roles reversed a little bit in terms of, you know, you were the one, of course, doing this and your father having the experience ahead of it. And now you're watching your daughter's career and seeing her, including seeing her uh, actually, you know, serving in, in combat regions. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say it's surreal because that would that would sound like I was, I was making it uh, larger than it was, but um, it, it really gives me a lot of respect uh, for what my dad did and, and the advice that my father gave me. And again, you know, my wife uh, comes from a military family. My father-in-law uh, was a B-52 navigator, retired from the Air Force. Um, and, and so my wife and I have gone through this process over the last 32 years. And um, my daughter's deployed right now on a six month deployment. And, you know, I'm proud of everybody that's out there today. I, I tell people all the time when I'm in situations like this and, and people, you know, ask me questions about being in the military, there are people like me that talk about it. And there's a whole nother generation that's out there and they're serving our country and, and making sacrifices for all of us. So um, our family couldn't be prouder of her. Wow. Yeah. So back to, to, to your story, um, you went to the academy. Tell me about your, your path into the cockpit from the academy. Yeah, so um, at the time, about 60% of academy classes, I graduated in a class of roughly 1,000. There were like 950 of us. And I think it was 55 or 60% of us were given the opportunity to go to pilot training. And I ended up going to pilot training uh, at a base that's now closed, Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas. And, you know, um, it was amazing. I have never been in a cockpit. You know, I, I soloed a T-41, which is like a Cessna 152 or 172 while I was at the academy. And that was the first time I'd ever been in the cockpit of an airplane in my life. Like I wasn't one of those people that showed up with my pilot's license. And so for me, it was a, a completely new um, experience in, in pilot training. And um, I was really fortunate. I, I had a great time while I was in pilot training. I did pretty well. And um, I received um, my first choice out of pilot training, which was a B-1 bomber 
Um, the, the B-1 had only been in service for a couple of years at that point when I graduated from pilot training in the fall of 90. And, um, and I, I um, asked for that airplane as, as my first choice on my dream sheet, and I received one. And I, I moved to uh, Rapid City, South Dakota and Ellsworth Air Force Base, and I flew the B-1 for about five years. It was awesome. Wow. Uh, tell me a little bit about flying the B-1. We had author Ken Katz here on the show. He wrote the, the sure. book on the B-1 bone, of course. Uh, sure. Also someone uh, here in New England. Um, what, what was your experience doing that? What made you, first of all, what made you, what made that your number one aircraft? Yeah, that was, that's an easy question for me. So uh, the, the concept of being low and going super fast was very appealing to me. Um, you know, it, it's fun to, to be in an F-15, I'm sure, and, and capping at 40,000 feet, you know, um, and doing things like that. But that experience of, of flying a low level when I was in pilot training in a T-38 um, or in a T-37 for that matter, and being low and fast was, was really appealing to me. And that's really what kind of solidified my choice um, to pick the B-1 as my, my first one. And, and again, as I mentioned, the airplane, for the sake of this conversation, it's funny to say, you know, with 35 years in my rearview mirror, um, but that airplane at the time was brand new. It had only been out for a couple of years. So a new airplane that could go faster than the speed of sound and, and fly 200 feet off the ground in the dark and in the mountains, um, that, that was a cool proposition for me. And so I chose it. Wow. You know, the other thing that, that strikes me about that is that is, you talk a lot about teamwork and a lot of things that you do and that you present and that, that is an aircraft about teamwork. That's an aircraft with a crew as opposed to, you know, and it's not even just a, you know, one person versus two seat fighter. That's, that's a, that's what four, I think in a B1, is that accurate? It is, uh, and, and you hit it right on the head, uh, the teamwork that goes into it. So it's the two pilots up front, and then the offensive systems operator in the back. Um, so an, uh, another officer um, whose responsibility was navigation and weapons delivery, so, so dropping the ordinance in a B-1. And then the other seat was a DSO, a defensive systems operator, and his or her job was to defend the aircraft against different kinds of missiles or triple A anti-aircraft artillery or anything that might be looking um, for the airplane. And so it really was a, a, a true crew environment, cockpit environment, just like you would see in a commercial airliner, but you double the number of people, as you mentioned, it's four, not two. That I think is incredibly relevant because it speaks a bit to, to who you are and then again, where you took things as you moved your, your career through towards being a single seat fighter. Um, was was it all about low and slow, or was there anything about that that teamwork that attracted you to go the bomber route in the beginning? Yeah, I don't know if it was so much that. It was more I meant than low and fast. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll take low and slow or low and fast. Either one of them works for me. I, I don't get picky about stuff like that. But um, no, I mean the the concept of the airplane and the mission was really the thing that resonated with me. Um, but you know the the concept of teamwork. Um, we talked about that a little bit the first time that we spoke. I mean, even when you get to a single seat fighter, it's so relevant, right? And in, in corporate America, where I've been for the last 20 plus years, you know, we always talk about teamwork and, and what we're doing. And the ultimate example is the United States military. And it's really a, a thing to see in the military because um, people are typically a lot younger than what we see in corporate America. And so, yeah, that teamwork thing is something that, that is pervasive no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're flying. And you know that as a pilot. Yeah. So yeah. let's let's talk a little bit about that transition into you know how how you found your way back again when it was when it was new when it was secret. Tell me about the the, the stealth fighter. In fact, it, just to before we even get started, I'm going to show a, uh, a a picture here to help some folks. I'm sure most people are familiar with the iconic aircraft, but there may be some that uh, that are not. And this when you, you the B1 incredibly gorgeous sleek but it certainly looks like an airplane at least right and the f-117 uh, a whole different beast T take me through the aircraft before we get into how you got into the seat yeah so um the, a great picture of the airplane to, to give you the idea it's it's the ultimate uh faceted airplane meaning facets like you see on a diamond and whenever people describe the airplane they talk about that there's not a single rounded surface on a stealth fighter uh, it has to do with the fact that the computing power that was available, believe it or not, in the mid to late 70s when this airplane was being de uh, designed 
was not powerful enough to um, compensate for curved surfaces. It couldn't predict um, the multitude of different directions that radar could reflect. So every surface on this airplane is flat. Um, one of the pictures that I love to show when I do these talks, and in fact, it's very small in the picture behind me, but if you look at the side of the stealth fighter, which is very much like, yes, but with the bomb bay doors closed, it's completely flat with the wheels up, bomb bay doors. So it's a, it's a mirror that's made to reflect energy as opposed to a perpendicular surface that would reflect radar energy back to the source. And so, yes, you mentioned it, uh, extremely unique airplane. Um, I really don't think we'll ever see anything like it because now um, with the power that we have in, in chips and computing, we see a lot of rounded surfaces, but that flat and internal storage is something that we see in our most modern fighters to include the F-22 and F-35. And, and this guy looks familiar. I've seen that guy before, yep. <laughs> that's, uh, that's actually a picture of me on the ramp in uh, Aviano, Italy, um, right before we started the conflict in Yugoslavia in 1999 over Kosovo. And um, it's ironic because that particular airplane is now at the Kalamazoo Air Museum uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And so they have that, that airplane, Chaba, completely restored, 817, uh, at their air museum. It's a beautiful, beautiful airplane. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. One thing that, that is, fascinates me, um, and I'd like you to pass this on to everybody here, is the concept of getting your name on a jet, getting your name on an aircraft. We, uh, I, we all think about that, and, and I've seen it. This came, I saw an image of you. And your name, of course, on the aircraft. Yes. And I was surprised the, to, to hear it's not quite what people think when they think a, 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 of an aircraft on that. Can you fill us all in on that? Of course. Yeah, and so um, I think most people have um, an understanding or perception that it's like World War II. Um, if, you know, if a lot of people have ever seen the movie Memphis Bell, or if you think about any kind of a fighter squadron in World War II, whether it was in the Pacific or whether it was in Europe, people would fly their own airplane. They had their name on the side. It has a specific name, like the Memphis Bell or whatever the case might be. And that's the way it was. Um, as time moved on and as we progressed and as technology changed, what happened is the way it worked when I was um, flying, you know, 25 plus years ago, and the way that I'm sure that it happens today is you don't, you don't necessarily fly your airplane you fly whatever uh, airplane is available in your squadron that's not being worked on or modified. And so, yeah, we, we do uh, get our names on the side of Air Force airplanes today, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna fly that airplane. In fact, you might only fly it a couple of times, believe it or not, in your entire career. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how the names work on the side of airplanes. That's that's really fascinating, because that, uh, you know, that I don't think most people know that. I certainly didn't know that. You, you think that you're always standing there next to your aircraft with your name on it. Um, well, the, the, the other thing that, that probably goes hand in hand with that, right, is if you think about general aviation, right? You don't go out and fly someone else's airplane. You fly your airplane, right? So, so I can understand how that concept uh, is out there, right? That people think that that's the way that it works in the military, but it's just, it's not like that at all. So how did you handle it when you're out doing uh, demonstrations or taking it to an air show or something along those lines? Yeah, well, in the, in the stealth, we did something that I thought was just genius. Uh, we, would, we would get to an air show and, you know, to make it personal for the people that were there coming to see the airplanes and static displays, in the stealth fighter, they just had a, a black uh, piece of metal and it was painted exactly like the outside of the airplane and it would have my name on it when I went to an air show. And there were two simple magnets on each side of this plaque, and they would just put it over the top of whose ever name was on the airplane, uh, so that I was when I was standing out talking to people um, about the airplane, they were looking at my name tag and seeing my name behind me on the jet. But that was just—I hate to ruin it for everyone, but it was just a plaque that. One of <laughs> trick, trick of the movies there for photo ops. <laughs> the, the really ironic thing about that is I have mine um, in my garage. And so I have um, the actual piece that I used to take to those air shows and it's in my possession. So. Perfect, now you just need a black Mac car and you're, yes. you're, you're good to go wherever you wanna go. 
I keep on telling my wife it needs to be a motorcycle, but it's going to have to be a pretty long one to get that thing to stick on the side. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, so you're you're a B one bomber pilot, and the right. and 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 you find your way into what the Air Force considers to be a fighter. How? Yeah, it was it was a really odd. I I had some very strange things that have happened to me throughout my life, and and I think we talked about this the first time we talked. I've been very fortunate. I've been very lucky. And what they did in the Air Force to, to make the story as, as short as possible is they used to have an exchange program in the 60s and the 70s where um, some bomber pilots would go fly fighters. And, and they called it SAC TAC exchange. SAC was Strategic Air Command bombers, and TAC was Tactical Air Command fighters. And so they would do this SAC TAC exchange. Well, they killed that program, and it was dead for five or 10 years. And then they resurrected it. And what they did is they said, look, if, if you're a bomber pilot and you want to apply for this program to go fly a fighter, you can do it. So the second year that the program was in existence, I think it was approximately 1995, I applied for that program. And I was ultimately one of four um, B-1 pilots that in that um, calendar year transitioned to a fighter. Um, one went to an F-16, one to an A-10, and then two of us ended up going to the stealth fighter, the F-117. And and how how did that happen? How did you uh, find out about that? Yeah, well, you know, I had a very strange experience because when we had to write down when I was applying for the program and they would take all your check rides and these scores and fitness reports and everything else, we had to fill out what was called, uh, commonly referred to as a dream sheet. And I had to rank order, you know, what's my first choice? What's the first fighter, if, if I had my dream come true, uh, that I would go to? And so I filled this list out and I sent it in. And about nine months later, um, somebody walked into me after I came back from a flight and said, hey, Thad, somebody from the Pentagon's on the phone and, and they want to talk to you. And I thought, why would the Pentagon be calling me? And I picked up the phone and this person on the other end of the phone said, hey, Captain Darger, we're reviewing your package for the fighter bomber crossflow. Um, we didn't see a stealth fighter on your dream sheet. And I said, well, I, I didn't even know a stealth fighter was available. And they said, well, they are. If you were to receive one, would you go and fly a stealth fighter? And I said, well, absolutely, I would go and fly a stealth fighter. And the guy said, well, thank you very much. And he went to hang up the phone. I was like, wait, wait, did I get one? And uh, he said, we'll be in touch. And uh, about two or three months later, I, I received a, a formal notification that, that I um, received a self fighter in that program and that I was going to transition into the airplane. And, you know, it was really cool because the guy that went with me, another B-1 pilot who was at a different base, but we became best friends, Ken Tatum, he ended up flying the stealth into retirement in 2008. Um, and in fact, was one of the few pilots to accumulate over a thousand hours in the airplane. And um, to the best of my knowledge, and Ken would know because he was with the program off and on until they retired the airplane in 2008, I think we were the only two bomber pilots uh, that ever went over and flew the stealth fighter. Everyone else had come from some other fighter into the program. Wow. So let's talk about that for a minute because it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to me and, and causes a quite a bit a, a stir among people that on one hand, it's a fighter. And it's called a fighter, but it doesn't really dogfight. It's a yeah. it, it puts down bombs. So right. reality is it's a bomber. So which is it, and what's the story behind this? So if I had um, what's a common phrase? If I had a nickel for every time I received this question, I'd be retired right now. I wouldn't be talking to you. Um, I always tell people it, it's it's really easy. Does you mentioned it? Does it do what? we typically associate with a fighter, which is dogfight. No, for that matter, and I'm not even gonna really go there, but an A-10 doesn't dogfight either, but it's not a fighter, right? It's a tap. Um, the stealth fighter is a single seat airplane and it delivers two bombs. That is the role of the airplane. Um, we have no bombers, have never had one to the best. Now somebody on the internet will find something and, and prove me wrong, but we've never had a single seat bomber. And the story, if you were to read Skunk Works um, by um, Ben Rich and, and the development of the stealth fighter, is that when the airplane was developed and when the plane was secret and being flown for over eight years, they were bringing in fighter pilots and showing them the airplane. And the way the story goes is that they didn't want to bring in the best fighter pilots at the time. 
and tell them that they were flying, you know, a B117 or an A117. And so it was a fighter. And um, so I, I never go one way or the other on, on whether it's a fighter or whether it's a bomber. I can tell you that at the time, it was the most precise bomb deliverer. I don't even know if that's a word. I think I put two ERs on the end of it um, that had ever been created. And so I'm going to go with a fighter because someone a lot smarter than me that had a lot more power than I have, uh, you know, nicknamed it a fighter. Um, but we delivered two bombs. There's no doubt about that. Wow. So you, so you've got two two guys that knew each other, B1 pilots. Yes. And it's time for you to fly, fly out and start learning this thing. What was your first introduction? to this aircraft like? What, was, what did it strike you and how, what was it like to start learning about this? Well, it was really wild. I, I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 89 and we publicized the airplane, meaning the government um, showed the first photo of it in 1988. Um, I applied for that fighter bomber crossflow program, like I said, roughly seven years later in, in 1995 and then went to the airplane in 97. And so you know, the airplane had been out, people were aware of it, obviously, um, but because there was such a small number of them, we only built 59 of them in the entire production run, that um, I think I'd only seen one once, and, and you know, so it was, it was very new to me. It wasn't like seeing an F-16 or an F-15 or something that we made thousands of. And, and going to the airplane was really cool. There, there aren't any two-seat versions of the airplane. So like most um, Air Force fighters, you know, there's somebody that sits right behind you, your instructor, just like in a T-38 when you're in pilot training or anything else, and they teach you. The stealth is very much like an A-10 in the fact that they didn't do that. And so our training um, involved tons of ground training, a lot of simulator time. And then the first time I stepped out to the jet, it was me and um, started it up and taxied it out. And... Our instructor pilots used to fly T-38s because they didn't want to put a lot of time on the other airframes, you know, to have uh, a stealth fighter being used by an instructor. And so we would pull out on the runway, our instructor would take off in a T-38 because of the different takeoff speeds and landing speeds. And he would come around the pattern, tell us to roll. And then as I lifted off on my first flight, I looked out the window and there was a black T-38 that pulled up right next to me and, and I was flying a stealth fighter. It was pretty cool. They paint the T-38s to match? They do. And um, if you've never seen a black T-38, I'm biased, but they look better in black. <laughs> they really do. So, yeah. I mean, when you're transitioning from a V-1 as a pilot, what's, what's the F-117 fly like? What's it about? Yeah, so a lot of people think because of those pictures that you showed and the way it looks that, that it has some crazy kind of uh, way that it flies. And I, I guess disappoint people all the time because I tell people that it flew like the other airplanes that I've flown, right? So I had a ton of experience in the T-38 because I'd gone to a pilot training base by the time I ended up at Holloman and I'd flown the B-1. And I tell people all the time, you know, the aircraft is inherently unstable or unstable meaning that without the four pedal probes on the front that went to four different flight computers, the airplane turned into a leaf. It wouldn't glide. It would just rock back and forth like a leaf that had fallen off of a tree. And, you know, take that out of the equation, meaning those computers did a really great job of compensating for the lack of aerodynamics in the airplane. Um, but we flew the exact same pattern as a T-38. We flew the exact same pattern as an F-16 or an F-15. And, you know, the only thing that when I've been asked this question before, I always tell people that it was just like flying any other airplane. The only difference was that we didn't have afterburners and the airplane is enormous. And so we had very long takeoff rolls. There were no flaps on the airplane. The wings were swept back at about 67 and a half degrees. So there was a real lack of lift. And so our takeoff rolls were super long and we would land really, really fast um, because of that not being able to create that extra lift with the flaps and, and the wings forward uh, like we would do in a B-1. But all in all, it flew like any other airplane. There wasn't anything magical that you had to learn, you know, to hold the stick and the throttles in an F-117. Mm. And was the computer control that, that made all of that possible and was kind of in between you and, and some of the controls. 
was there any difference about that? The fact that you're, you're, I guess, not indirect, or was it just engineered so well that you just couldn't tell? Uh, the second part, engineered so well that you couldn't tell. Meaning, the, you couldn't tell that it was uh, a fly-by wire, which essentially everything's become now, right? It's, it's not a cable and pulley system like pilots had been used to since the beginning of time. It's more actuators and everything else. But that fly-by-wire component of the stealth fighter is what made it flyable. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, that, that made it handle just like any other airplane. The only thing that was odd about the aircraft, and it was the reason, um, based on what I've been told, of why people had to fly other aircraft before they could go to a stealth fighter, is at the beginning of the program, there was a real component of spatial disorientation, meaning the, the normal cues, the noise, when the airplane would be going very fast was limited. Um, obviously, when you saw the cockpit, um, there was limited visibility in, in many instances. And there were a couple of airplanes that they actually lost at the beginning of the program um, because of, of spatial D. And there was, a, there was actually a really, really cool uh, control in the stealth fighter that I've never really talked about before, um, but we called it a tongue depressor. It was a, um, a piece on the front of the throttle. And on our check rides, we would use this device. And what it was made for was to help recover the aircraft without the pilot. And so we would put ourselves in an unusual attitude and we would push this tongue depressor. We just click this handle on the front of the throttle and the airplane would roll out and then it would start a climb, whether you were pointing at the ground or whatever the case might be. And all you had to do was advance the throttles um, to make up for those problems that they'd had with spatial disorientation. Wow. So it's like back all the all those years ago it's kind of similar to the you know the level button that some of the autopilots are getting and and modern that's autopilots right. have uh and that you had it then because of spatial disorientation that's right that's that's right. fascinating now yeah. i can imagine that another factor in that is that one of the key differences is your flying is it basically exclusively at night yes well definitely in combat Right, the, the airplane's painted black uh, because of the fact that it's only going to be used at night. And when we did all of our training, except for in the summer in New Mexico, when we had really bad thunderstorms, we would typically um, fly only at night. And mm -hmm. so I would say that uh, probably 60 or 70 percent of the flight time that I ended up with in self fighter was purely at night. Um, so, yeah, you're right. That's that's really the only time that we ever flew it. And so and so you're you're spending an awful lot of time. Uh, compared to other jets flying without external horizon references, or at least not necessarily really good ones. <laughs> You've yes, got some definitely. on good nights. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Wow. Uh, let's talk stealth for a minute, because obviously sure. that's in the, in the name and, and right. everything else. Uh, tell me a little bit about the concept and what it meant back then when the, when the stealth fighter came out. Yeah, well, what it meant back then, and, and I you know, still tell people this today, is that we had a technology that no one else had. And we proved uh, in the first Gulf War in 91 that those airplanes, could, those airplanes could go places that regular airplanes couldn't go and, and essentially reach out and get to the most heavily defended areas uh, in the world. And the, the concept of stealth and what Lockheed and Skunk Works in particular were able to do when they put the airplane together is um, still today nothing short of amazing. Because uh, I think we, we touched on this the, the first time we talked. To make a stealth fighter and make any airplane stealthy, it's not just a component of the radar cross section or the ability to look very small on radar. Uh, I don't know if these are all five of the, the areas, but I've kind of started talking about five different things that you need to be stealthy in an airplane. And it's that radar cross section that we talked about. There also needs to be something that you're doing to control your heat signature because there are heat seeking missiles that are out there as well. And then it's really sight, sound, and then emissions, meaning anything that comes out of the airplane, whether it's you talking on the radio or a radar altimeter or even a weather radar, there are passive systems out there that can detect those kind of things. So to truly be stealthy, you need a low radar cross section, a low heat signature, you need to, to have that component of black paint and, and flying at night, then you need to kind of be quiet, right? Because you don't want to be able to hear something coming. Um, and then you need to control those emissions. And Lockheed Martin and Skunk Works did all of those things. 
And, and how, I tell, how, how do they do the individual ones? Can you go through a couple of those? And, and I mean, the, the, the really, to just do it really quick so that I don't take up a lot of your audience's time is the radar cross section, which- that, 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 That's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. But what, what everybody associates with, with being stealthy and, and minimizing the size of an airplane as far as detecting it on radar, that was based off the shape, what we talked about at the beginning, the, the facets on the airplane and reflecting energy away. There was also a special skin that was actually glued onto the outside of the airplane. It was called RAM, radar absorbent material. And that did about 10 or 15% of, of keeping the radar cross section down. Um, as far as the heat was concerned, um, the exhaust on a stealth fighter is one of the most unique things I've ever seen. Um, it's about 18 inches high, and it's probably 16 feet long for each engine. And the reason that they did that was so instead of having a pinpoint, like after burning heat source, um, they spread all of that heat out. And then what they did was they recessed the exhaust so that underneath there was a piece that stuck out that was lined with ceramic tiles, like space shuttle tiles so that the heat uh, would not be visible. So I, that, that's a long explanation to say, very special exhaust. Um, we talked about the site, we're gonna fly at night, you're gonna paint the airplane black, right? They, they're essentially invisible from a, from a site standpoint. The sound went hand in hand with the fact that we were non afterburning, so it, it kind of had to do with the exhaust um, that I just mentioned that helped um, with the heat. And then from an emission standpoint, um, we did a thing in the jet that we called the stealth check, and that, and that wasn't slang, it was, it was true. And we had a lot of different antennas um, and things that we would turn off before we went into a combat situation. And so we could retract some of our antennas um, back up into the airplane um, and then bring those antennas back out after we were out of a combat or a threat area um, to be able to communicate, navigate, and fly an approach for that matter. Um, but that's how we controlled our emissions by just turning off um, anything that would emit and then getting rid of those antennas. So you put all five of those things together and you have an airplane that's very hard to detect. That's amazing. And uh, yeah. you know, one of, one of the things that I always, it, it sounds goofy, but I was remember it was described on the news as what has the radar signature of like a flock of birds or something along those lines, to which I always hey. wondered, uh, what's that? Not a flock, a bird. Just a bird. Yeah, so, so it, it's actually come out and the, the radar cross section was about a thousandth of a meter squared. So, so it, was, it, was, it was probably somewhere around the size of a sparrow. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, that very simply explains the next thing because I always wondered if you're talking about something like a, a group like that, we'll just look for a 500 mile an hour bird. But yes. I mean, but at that point, I assume you're not seeing on radar something the size of a sparrow. So that is impressive. It really is. And, and you know, the thing is, and, um, you know, a stealth fighter was lost in the conflict that I flew in in, in 1999. In fact, on the fifth night of the war, um, we lost this airplane. And, you know, people used to always say, oh, it, it was stealth. It was, it was invisible. No, uh, no one ever claimed that stealth technology, it's, it's not a cloaking device, right? It's not a Klingon in, in you know, Star Trek, or whatever the case might be. The, the concept and what people that are associated with stealth technologies, the words that they use are low observable. Um, and that's what a stealth fighter was. It was, it was a low observable airplane and, and it wasn't invisible, but it was very, very tiny and very, very hard to detect, especially in a combat situation where you have all these different support airplanes that are jamming radars and, and shooting high-speed anti-radiation missiles at, at radars and everything else. So when you add that fog and friction of war with something that looks like a 500 mile per hour sparrow, I'm gonna use your term from now on, um, it's very hard to detect and, and very hard to um, then engage um, either with a missile or with uh, ground-based artillery. Yeah, and there is, there was really only one. Is that correct? That 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 did get get shot down. Uh, tell me about that story. That's correct. Yeah, it was really amazing. So um, the airplane um, was shot down on the fifth night of the war um, over Yugoslavia. Um, the the tail number, not that it matters, was 806. 
Um, and, and again, I mentioned these weird things that have happened in my life. I flew that tail number 806, 13.9 um, hours nonstop um, from New Mexico to Northern Italy um, to get the airplane from the base that we were stationed at over um, to stage it to go to the war. Um, but anyway, on the, on the fifth night of the war, um, it was shot down by a, by a modified, it's called an SA-3 is the Russian designation, a GOA, um, surface to air missile. And the pilot ended up ejecting um, from the air, airplane um, while he was under the canopy, he pulled out his survival radio and started talking to a tanker, uh, air refueling tanker in the air. And eight hours later, um, the only country that I'm aware of that could ever do anything like this, the United States, we flew in and picked him up. And he was the equivalent of about 60 miles um, from Belgrade, their capital. And obviously to put that in context to other people, I always tell them it would be as if another country came in lost one of their aircraft and a pilot 60 miles outside of Washington, D.C., and then they came in and, and picked him up. And that's exactly what we were able to do um, with this pilot um, when he was shot down on that particular night. And, you know, people always ask me how that happened. And again, I'm, I'm not, you know, I didn't retire as a four-star general out of the Air Force, and, and I wasn't the program director for the self fighter, but I tell people that there were really three different things um, that played into it. And that was the fact that we were being predictable. And, and there have been a lot of things written about that, meaning we were kind of going into country at the same time at night in the same general area, um, you know, using the same uh, ingresses and things like that. And so we were being a little bit predictable on our side. On the flip side, the Yugoslavs um, and the Serbians had modified uh, the radar on this particular um, missile system. And um, when, he opened up his bomb bay doors because remember we talked about how flat the airplane was and you showed a picture of the bomb bay open and the bomb bay would only be open for a split second. We didn't manually control it. It was controlled by the airplane. But when that bomb bay was open through some predictability, the modification of their radar, there you go. See that when you don't look like a sparrow and that's open, um, you look like a barn. Um, because that's perpendicular to the airplane, and, and that's big. But anyway, predictability, they modified their radar, and then um, just like everything in life, um, they were lucky. And um, on that night, an SA-3 um, took him down. Um, the ironic thing about it is um, sometimes people, and, and I won't say who, kind of laugh, and they say, oh, we didn't know your self-fighter was invisible or whatever. Um, you know, the really sad thing is the fact that in 20 or back then in 1999, right, that, that people were still hurting each other and, and killing each other um, and that there has to be conflict in the first place. Um, but back to that specific uh, event and, and a self fighter being shot down, that was on night five. The conflict ended on night 76 mm -hmm. and um, the stealth fighter went into the most heavily defended um, areas. In fact, roughly 16 of them a night um, for the next 70 plus nights. And so it wasn't like somebody found uh, the magic solution uh, to being able to bring down a stealth fighter, because if they would have, then that would have happened more often in that conflict. Yeah, you're talking about like 1,200 flights and, yeah. and, yeah. and only one. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah. But again, when, when people bring it up, I mean, I, again, you, you have to give the Serbs credit. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the coolest part of the story, and I think we touched on this um, when we talked, is that the pilot that was shot down wouldn't let his name be released for about five years. Um, and, and he was actually a very good friend of mine. It was, it was my squadron, the 8th Fighter Squadron. And when he released his name, the, the battery commander who had shot him down reached out to him, and they became friends. The and Yugoslavian. That's Battery. right, the sir, wow. yep. And, <laughs> and, and so his name was Zoltan Danny, and he reached out to the pilot, um, Dale Zelko. And if you Google them today, um, they've made a couple of documentaries about their relationship, and they see each other every year. And so um, Zoltan will come to the United States and, and go visit um, Dale at his house, and they'll play basketball together. There's pictures on the internet of them cooking together. And on the flip side, um, Dale, the self-fighter pilot, has actually been um, to Belgrade 
and the canopy from that cell fight of his ejection seat are, are in a museum. And there's a picture of um, Zoltan Dani, the, the battery commander, and Dale Zelko, the fighter pilot, standing in front of his ejection seat and canopy. And the really cool story, or the cool part about the story is that, you know, they were both just doing the best that they could do for their countries at the time. And to realize that there's still a humanity um, in that kind of a conflict, and this isn't the first time that it's happened, right? There's been people that have met up probably in every conflict since conflict started. Um, but to know that that's kind of what happened with this stealth fighter, it's a really cool story and, and something that I really encourage people to look up. Wow, that's, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah, that is definitely worth looking up and, and, and quite yeah. remarkable. Do yeah. you, when you talk, it, tell me a little bit more about what goes into a mission, what was involved in, in, in fighting in Yugoslavia, because this plays in a lot to how you feel about kind of teamwork and absolutely and it's i find it kind of enlightening yeah it, it it really is and i tell people all the time you know when they when they go out you see a movie like top gun or you see any movie where you see fighter pilots or single seat pilots or even two pilots in an airplane you think wow that that's just those two individuals and, and they're out doing whatever it is that they're doing and back to what we were talking about right at the beginning of our talk about teamwork you know, to fly a stealth fighter mission, the planning of it back then um, would start 24 hours in advance, meaning there was a very complex software um, that we used to plan the missions because the, the flight path, just like you were talking about using your navigation system to get onto New Jersey, um, our flight path was very deliberate. And, and to make it even crazier, when the eight of us would go into country, we would all split up. So we would fly eight different routes. It's not like a typical fighter where they fly in a two ship where two people stay together. We would all split up. And the idea was to confuse anything that was trying to find us by randomly turning, um, changing altitude, um, and doing all of these other things. And so the process would start 24 hours ahead of time. Somebody would be planning these missions. You know, I tell people all the time, there'd be intelligence officers that would be inputting information on threats. There would be weather people, you know, briefing us about what the conditions might be, or at least, you know, um, preparing for that. Out of the flight line, and I'm gonna leave people out, but there were maintainers, there were people that worked in the weapons department that were uploading the weapons, people in air refueling, people in avionics, all of these people that would be working on the jet for 24 hours, and then we would show up and we would get a briefing and they would give us those routes so that we could see where we were all flying. And we would step out to the jet and you know, you think, wow, you've been talking for three or four minutes about teamwork and all these different people. Well, that's when it really started because we would take off and to fly missions in Yugoslavia, we would have roughly um, 10 to 12 support airplanes to get eight uh, stealth fighters into downtown Belgrade. And the support airplanes included either two or four F-15s that were up to protect us from air-to-air -air threats, right? They were uh, dog fighters. That's what they were made to do, F-15C models. We had F-16 CJs that were, they carried harms, high-speed anti-radiation missiles. So if a, a radar came up to try to detect us, they would shoot a missile at that site. And then um, back in those days, we either had Navy or Marine Corps EA-6Bs. So they were electronic jammers that would sit outside the city and then flood um, our target area with all of this electronic noise, again, so that they couldn't detect us. So between F-15s and F-16s and EA-6s, between the KC-135s or KC-10s that refueled us before and after the target area, and then on top of it, an AWACS airplane, so the, the huge black dome that spins on the top of what looks to be a very large airliner. All of those things were in place to get eight single seat airplanes into a target area. And so it was the ultimate teamwork, meaning I haven't heard anything that involves more teamwork um, than what it took to get those stealth fighters into a very, very heavily defended area. That's that's really remarkable, and yeah. especially because when you think about what we're all trained to believe and see and understand from watching movies and things like that, right. you first you're talking about formation and you're all split up in right. the case of, of the self. Um, 
and then the idea, which I hadn't heard before, that that you had these F F fifteens were they orbiting and yes. in order to do that. So so they would be, in, and the EA sixes were the exact same way, and the F sixteen. So so they would be in a two ships. So there'd be two of them together, and what they would do is they would fly what looked like a racetrack on the outskirts of the city so that one of the airplanes, one of the F-15s was always pointing at the city when the other one was coming out. And then as, as they turned away from the city, the other one would turn in. The jammers did that, the F-16s that were shooting those harms did the exact same thing. And so they were always in a two ship so that one of them was always pointed at our target area. And so, yeah, they, they were there and their their mission or their role was to make sure that our strike package made it in and made it out um, without any damage. Amazing. I mean, those all are individual. In fact, it's it, it's almost not you think of it in terms of support roles, but they're all individual attack roles uh, in in what they they're are. each doing. They are. Yeah. Um, very very complicated. Um, you know, just to get all those airplanes to a tanker and to, to have them all marshal or, or cap and prepare to go into the country, um, just to do that is a very complicated thing. But then to actually execute uh, a mission um, takes that complexity level to another, you know, another step. Because, you know, if one of those airplanes aren't pointing at the target area, meaning if they both are going up on it at the same time, something bad could happen. And mm -hmm. so, that's the professionalism that we see in our military, whether it's the Air Force or the Navy or the Marine Corps or the Coast Guard or whatever. Um, that's the kind of professionalism that we have, you know, very, very young people in many instances out doing for us every day to help us. And that's what we did back then. Wow. Now, yeah. this, the stealth aircraft, and by the way, it, do you personally, it gets referred to, of course, as stealth fighter. It gets referred to as Nighthawk. What's the what's the inside way of the right way of saying it? Well, it's it's no, no one really calls it the Nighthawk. Um, so people call it the stealth fighter, um, and a lot of people just uh, refer to it as the black jet. <laughs> the black jet. <laughs> black jet. If you called it a black jet, I'd know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so yeah. this was at the point which which really was the beginning of, of of precision, or about as close as you get a precision munition delivery. Um, for bombing, what? Tell me a little bit about that, since you were the one kind of laying that laying that down. Yeah. It, so I tell people, and I, I think I use the expression already that that we were the most accurate, you know, uh, airplane that had ever been designed uh, to deliver weapons. And the the way that the self fighter worked is that we were typically dropping uh, what you would refer to as dumb bombs, um, you know, two thousand pound bombs or five hundred pound bombs but they had a tail kit, so they had some fins that would help guide the munition on the back of that bomb. And then on the front of the bomb, they had a, uh, a nose or a targeting system. I actually call it an eye because that's exactly what it looked like. And the way the weapons worked and the way the stealth fighter worked is that we would um, make our way to a target. Um, we would be able to look at an infrared screen, so we were just seeing differences in heat um, the, the color of the screen was monochrome. It wasn't colored. It was different shades of grays and blacks and whites. And we would make our way to a target. And wherever we placed the crosshairs, because we had a little tiny joystick that was over on our throttles that we controlled with our left hand. And so we would use these infrared images uh, of the target area. So just eight by 10 pieces of paper. We would compare it to what we were seeing on this infrared screen that was smaller than uh, today's laptops. And then we would hold the crosshairs over the target. And in the last couple of seconds of the flight of the bomb, a laser that wasn't visible to the eye would fire. When the laser fired right under the target, the eye of the bomb would open up, look for that particular laser spot, and go right into the middle of it. And you know, our precision um, was within feet. It, it, it wasn't within meters. It wasn't three feet. It was within feet, and um, it was really, really accurate. Ironically, um, the stealth bomber, the B-2, was also used in that conflict, and they were the first aircraft to use our most modern weapon back then, which was called JDAM, the Joint Direct Attack Munition, and that was the next phase of accuracy because 
those bombs were guided by their own GPS. So mm. most of the things that are delivered, the B1 um, actually delivered the most number of JDAMs um, during the same conflict in, in 1999 and, and in the Gulf afterwards and in Afghanistan. Those weapons now can be dropped 30, 40 miles away, depending on your altitude. And then a GPS um, guides the bomb to the target, not a laser. Wow. So I don't know if I just made that complicated, but back in the day when we did it, if we couldn't see the target, then we weren't going to attack or, or bomb that target because we needed to see it to laze it. Yeah, so basically you weren't, you were a night fighter, but not an all weather fighter. That is a fact. That is yeah. a fact. In fact, if you read about Operation Allied Force and that conflict, um, the, the stealth fighter in particular, because we couldn't see through clouds, and so we didn't have the kind of flexibility that those other airframes that had those JDAMs had, um, if we couldn't see the target, we couldn't drop. So mm. I think uh, probably half of the sorties or the missions that I took off on, half of them I didn't even go in the country. Meaning wow. they would, right. we would go up, all of us would, would get gas, we would prepare, and then somebody would call it off and, and we would abort what we were going to do. And so it was a real challenge because that conflict started in the spring and exist, uh, went on until early summer and the weather was not ideal um, for using our airplane. Then. Wow. Now, when you talk about accuracy and, and some of those things, it, it makes me smile, makes me think of what some of the things, when you came out of the B-1, you were bomber guys in the middle of a bunch of fighter guys training. Right. Right. And, and that, tell me about that training and tell me about how that involved uh, some, some uh, I guess, uh, target practice. Yeah, I mean, the, the airplane was, was so good at doing calculations and with just ranging that we would come back and to go through um, the motions to make sure that we weren't going to fail in the combat situation, we would sometimes go onto a range and, and drop a bomb that was like the size of a bowling pin. It was, it was just filled with concrete. It wasn't guided. It didn't have any guidance on it. And it just had a phosphorus charge on the back so that when it hit the ground, there'd be this white splash on our screens that we could see. And the airplane could deliver those really well. Um, but that was our only mission. You know, you, you talked earlier about, is it a fighter or is it a bomber? When you look at an all-purpose fighter, like an F-16, right, that does everything, it can dogfight, it can drop bombs, it can, you name it, we were talking about it launching arms. You know, those guys, those guys practice for everything. You know, an F-15C, all they do is dogfight. So, so they dogfight 24 seven. We would go out on training missions. We would start off the mission with the practice stealth check, right? Because we're simulating that we are going into country. And then what we would do is we would spend an hour um, flying, uh, typically in the CONUS in the United States of America, and, and finding very, very small targets and simulating that we are attacking those targets, meaning we wouldn't drop anything and, and we wouldn't actually flip switches, but we would hold the crosshairs on the target until it counted down to zero, which normally meant that the bomb was hitting the target. And, and we would go out and, and simulate 14 or 15 different targets in an hour and a half long flight, and then come back, drop that dummy bomb, just to make sure that we have the muscle memory and the head memory of flipping the switches, and then we'd land. And that's why we were so good at what we did. I mean, um, we were, um, if we were sent after a target, we wouldn't attack something the size of a house and just um, say, okay, well, my crosshairs were on the house. We would actually look at an image and we would say, no, your crosshairs have to be on the chimney or your crosshairs have to be on this air conditioning duct or whatever the case might be. <laughs> well, because that's how, that's how accurate we were. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't good enough to just say, oh, my crosshairs are just kind of bouncing around on the roof of something. The whole concept was to keep that laser spot on a very specific spot um, because it was our weapons officers and the people of the intel that planned our missions, if we're attacking a bridge or a control tower, or a bunker or a building, there was a very specific reason for us to hit a target in a very specific spot. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we trained to 24 seven. It was really, uh, really a, a cool experience. It really was. Wow. And, and is it true that, that, you, that you and your other uh, B1 uh, a friend that, that were both uh, uh, over there in that class basically uh, were, were the, the best at doing that? <laughs> Did you win something on that? I, 
we did. And, and I, you know, you, you asked about the, the fighter and the bomber thing, you know, um, there, there were some people that weren't super happy about having these bomber guys show up to, to fly their fighter. And um, yeah, we, we showed up and, and my counterpart, um, Ken Tatum, I think the, the first four or five months, meaning not, not four or five months into us flying the stealth fighter, but starting the first month, um, when we both finished our training and ended up in the eight, um, you know, because all we did was simulate hitting these targets, we would keep track of them and, and we would keep track of your hit rate. And every month they would give an award for who had the highest hit rate. And, um, you know, my dad always tells me that stories get longer and longer as you get older and older. So maybe I'm embellishing a little bit, but I think Ken won that contest the first four or five, six months. Uh, that we were in the squadron, and the first month he didn't win, and I won. Um, and I won a couple of times, so um, I guess it wasn't that bad of a thing to have a couple of B1 guys in the self fighter for a little while. Yeah, turns out it wasn't too bad. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Thad, thank you so much for joining us here on Social Flight Live. Your story is fantastic, and it, it just the the next time that I'm at a museum or somewhere else, uh, it it just makes it so much more personal. And I do want to end on one thing, which is the it seems that we were told it was being retired, but it doesn't seem like the stealth is completely retired. What's happening no. with that? No, I, I, uh, that's a great question. Um, I can tell you this, and, and it's, you can Google it and everything else. In 2008, um, we sent all the self fighters back to where they came from um, in Tonopah, where, where they flew when they were secret. Um, sometime after that, there started to be all these little sparks on the internet uh, about the F-117 and people seeing them. And I was like, no, that's impossible. They're decommissioning them and chopping them up. And some museums have them and everything else. Um, but ironically, um, they are flying. And every day when I get onto Instagram or TikTok, uh, I see a, a self fighter that's in the air. And um, they've been sighted at a lot of civilian fields uh, across the country. And um, there is a test unit in the Air Force uh, that is still flying uh, stealth fighters. And the Air Force hasn't come out and said exactly why um, they're doing that. Um, but if I was going to guess, as a, as a former uh, stealth fighter pilot, uh, they're probably doing that to um, use a very low observable, so a small radar cross-section type airplane, um, against either our airplanes or against maybe systems from other countries that, that we acquire in one way or the other, um, just to see how they work. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, stealth fighter retired in 2008 but not really retired. That's well said. <laughs> oh, that's a great way to put it again. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here. I really appreciate it. It's fascinating. And hopefully I, we will get you soon uh, right here in the, in the shop here at the at, at social plate with the uh, Mustang. Whenever you need me to take that 20 minute drive, you just let me know. And um, <laughs> thank you very much for including me in your program. You've had some incredible guests on your show and um, it was very humbling to be invited. So thank you very much, Jeff. I really do appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, Dad. You do the same. Take care, Chuck. Take care. Bye-bye. And thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be off next week for the July 4th holiday and uh, wishing the best to you and your family for a safe and wonderful opportunity to spend some time together over the celebration of July 4th. Be back on July 11th. Please join us here on July 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern time as usual with Daryl Taylor, General Manager of Air Power, with his amazing personal story and what you need to know when it's time for a new engine. Air Power is a really uh, interesting company and uh, there's uh, so much information about that and his background is really truly fascinating with Columbia Aircraft and uh, an Eclipse as well and so uh, really going to be a fun evening there. And then uh, IR Air Venture is coming, so will there be a lot more coming when it comes time for that? Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight, and I wish you all blue skies.